Good morning, Life Path. We are so excited. As you know, we pre-record these services on Thursday night, so just we're just going to invite God. We're going to we're going to trust that whatever He is stirring in us on Thursdays is going to show up on Sundays, if that makes any sense. But God, we invite you here. We invite your presence. We welcome you. We want you to open up and meet us here tonight as we record this and Sunday morning as we worship together as a church.
your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, O oh my soul His holy name was we'll sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Your rich in love and your soul to anger. Your name great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to die bless the Lord oh my soul oh Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Oh, 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 this next one we're going to get everybody out there clapping and if you mess it up you know what nobody's going to know the difference all the people said amen
Church. I'm Jackie Martinez, and I'm the Children and Connections Director. Good morning to our live stream audience, who we love that you plug in with us every Sunday. Pastor Elliot is on vacation still. He will be with us this Sunday coming up, so keep him in prayer. Uh, this morning, we have Joanne Stevenson, who has a quick announcement for us. Good morning. Um, just a reminder that October is Pastor and Staff Appreciation Month, and so we're asking you to write notes of encouragement, uh, to give cards to the pastors and staff. They, they could be paid or unpaid staff. Uh, we have some blank cards at a table in the foyer, and you can just drop them in the basket there, or you can bring your own card. And just we will we'll give those to uh, the pastors and staff on November 1st. So thank you for thinking of them and showing them how much you appreciate them. Awesome. Another exciting thing that's happening is next Sunday, our Kids Town Children's Program will be opening. Um, it is going to be during the second service, so it's the 11 o'clock service. We will open a few minutes in advance. Um, also, we sent, I sent an email last week, and I'm sending it again this week, just to show you how to do the touchless uh, check-in system, so that you can just get the app on your phone, and click and check them in. Uh, it should be quick and easy, but you can also email me if you have any questions. My email is on the website. So let us pray real quick um, just so we can receive the sermon today, but also we will have a quick word of encouragement from our Reyes family. So I hope you enjoy that. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for the blessing and opportunity it is to just come together to lift your name on high. We thank you for all those watching um, in the comfort of their home. And we just pray, Lord God, uh, for safety and health for all of them, Lord. And we just thank you for the children that are coming back. And we thank you for those um, who are here, Father. And we just pray for this word this morning that it will bless our hearts. And we thank you for the word of encouragement that we're about to watch. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, Life Path family. This is the Reyes family. Um, my name is Peter. My wife, Carmen, Sebastian, Julianne, and Jacob, our children, we'd like to offer a few words of encouragement. This is 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Um, this is Matthew 6.33. 
and it says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I'm reading Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and learn not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, and do everything with love. We're looking forward to getting to see everyone again, and we'll be praying for you. I turn my mic off in between the services uh, to save the battery just to avoid that very situation, which I then caused myself. Awesome. <laughs> it's great to see live stream this morning, even, even though we don't see you. Somehow I still see like Mrs. Gracie there. I just know you're watching and Ann Strong and, and uh, uh, Bob Scott, just some of the faces I'm thinking about. Don McGraw and his son always say hello to each other in the Facebook comments, which is hilarious. Uh, my wife and I read your comments on the way home uh, when we decompress, is what we call it, when we leave church. And so keep commenting on Facebook, on YouTube. Let us know you're out there. Uh, we want you to feel connected to each other, to everyone here this morning, uh, so we can worship together. We are a family of God, and uh, we need each other. So I have... Um, a little bitty skull ring that lights up. And Mr. Jacob here of the Reyes family gave me this little magnet Rubik's Cube. You can't even see it. It's so tiny. But sure enough, I'm fidgeting with it. It's going to be in my hand probably the entire message. But Jacob, we're going to do a trade. You need to come get your skull ring here, my man. This thing is cool. And it's going to mean a dad joke that I'm now going to tell the church. What did the pirate say when he turned 80? I, matey. Yes, that's a good one, Jack. Sometimes when I tell a dad joke to Mark Potter, who's probably also watching, and if it's a bad, bad joke, dad joke, a bad, bad joke, yeah, um, he'll say it was a groaner, that it made him groan. So I... Mark, I know you're groaning now on that one. Uh, but it is Halloween season. It's spooky season. And the Reyes family did their video in a scary room of the building. We have motion detector lights in this place. So if they're working properly, the light only comes on if there's motion in the room. And the middle school Bible study room, the light is always on. And it just creeps me out because, of course, I think it's just a bunch of heroes of the Bible that are having like a meeting in there uh, when it's probably rats instead. Or what Miss Jackie saw at our church, and I wasn't here to witness it, but Joe did a seven foot snake inside the building. She apparently screamed as if it was a seven foot foot snake, probably more like seven inches, very tiny, but uh, apparently Jackie can scream, very high-pitched scream, yes, okay, okay, this is uh, bothering me, Azalea, come sit next to Julie, Brianne, come sit next to Azalea, we are a youth group, we are a church family, and all three of you know each other, sit together, yes, yes, we are uh, rearranging here in this place, uh, it's so good to see you, keep praying for Pastor Elliot, and uh, appreciate you uh, putting up with me, tolerating me for these two Sundays. Uh, I know he'll, he will come home refreshed with a, a full head of thick hair, you know, because he's just going to be so relaxed uh, from vacation. But no, when he goes on vacation, he reads like super nerdy books. Like, you know, he, he doesn't like even do relaxing reading. You know that book that he mentioned a couple of Sundays ago that he said one of the, was one of the greatest books I made the mistake of asking him about it. It's going to basically take the rest of my life to read this book. It is like, like, like a weapon, right? And I don't even know where I'm going to find it, but it is, it is huge. <laughs> um, 
But uh, yeah, that, that's our pastor. I mean, he loves to read like I love to run and play sports, and he's good at it. He's good at reading. It's a skill, and, uh, and we appreciate that. We are blessed uh, because of his reading. Um, does anyone in here need to feel more bold in your walk with Jesus? Does anyone in here need to feel more bold, more courageous in your walk with Christ. Uh, does anyone in here struggle with fear about things, all kinds of things uh, that make us afraid? Uh, this message is going to encourage you this morning. It's going to challenge you. Uh, but before we begin, it's going to be a shorter message, um, but I just want to set the table that I think you're going to leave feeling more bold. Uh, but yes, before we continue, we did our pledge card drive here at the church, and um, it's to create that budget for 2021 and to give us some answers on how we can do ministry in this place next year. And of course, this year has been beyond crazy. Uh, unprecedented is a word you hear a lot. We hear that word so often, but it is true. It's a highly unusual year, right, Omar? Everything has been so different, um, which makes this year uh, knowing where we stand as a church even more important as we go into 2021. Uh, so you see, that's where we're at now. We've had about 67 different pledges, different pledge cards, and that represents about 67% of our budget. So we really want to get about uh, 75 to 80 pledge cards. Cards. Sometimes the pledges are going to be small. You know, you give what you can give. And there's no guarantees around this place. This is not an exact science because as Christians in the Bible, we're told to take a step of faith, right? But we're also told in the Bible to show wisdom. So we want to find that space in between, that balance uh, where we're showing faith, but we're also showing wisdom and that's what the pledge drive is it is a step of faith because you could lose your job maybe you have to move maybe something happens in your family you get a sickness and your money is diverted to more important things like your health right um but we still need an idea and miss carol castro in our office our finance elders they are so responsible you know, we often joke with them that we wouldn't spend anything if it, you know, if it was up to our finance elders, right? Um, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We're trying to be responsible with the Lord's money. You guys know that we cut back in lots of ways. So it will help us immensely if you will still turn in a pledge card if you have not done so already. Regardless of that amount, the bank also looks at how many pledges are made. Because it tells the bank they care about numbers, right? But when a bunch of pledge cards get turned in, it's, it tells them this church is united. This church is together, which means their goals are going to be reached, right? And that's what a bank, when you go to refinance stuff, all that boring uh, bank stuff. Sorry, Bob Scott, I know you worked for a bank. Not boring to you, uh, but I'm a pastor. Um, so 67% of the budget, we'd love to get that to at least 75% to 80 Carol tells me that's about $60,000. Spread out over a year with multiple pledge cards being turned in is not that much. It just means we need to turn in that pledge card regardless of the amount we think we can give annually. So uh, make Pastor Elliot proud of me <laughs> by turning in that pledge card because he'll be so thrilled because normally he's the one that has to say these things and no pastor likes to, so I'm trying to help him out and, uh, and make him proud, okay? So thank you for listening to that. Look at these pictures. We've been busy this weekend serving the Lord here at Light Path Church. You gave so much candy. Oh, my goodness. That made Dr. Sauer, our retired dentist, really nervous how much candy you donated uh, for our trunk or treat. We put together the bags of candy. Uh, there's Miss Rose. She is a student at heart. And you don't mess with her crafting abilities. She carries scissors in her tank top. Like, who does that? Normally when I think of someone crafty, I'm thinking, you know, I could take this person, right? You know, I could take this. 
Miss Rose, I'm like, it's just, I was looking at those scissors the whole time. I'm like, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Uh, but really appreciate her coming to help our students put together the bags of candy, almost 300 bags of candy. So you'll hear more about Trunk or Treat. You're seeing all the pictures now from landscaping. Uh, we pulled weeds. We pulled weeds uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, we turned our Garden of Weeden into a Garden of Eden. Yes, Miss Carol Castro has a new haircut. It looks so cool. You may not recognize her this morning, but we really appreciate all our volunteers uh, coming out. Miss Lanethia, our slide operator, and her son Benjamin, uh, who came out. You saw Norman and his sons. There is the legendary Patty Tipton. Um, I haven't seen her this morning. I know she was feeling really sore <laughs> after pulling weeds. We still have some flowers out there as well. Uh, but especially those flower beds, right when you enter the parking lot, they were like solid grass, uh, and now they're clear. That's uh, Adrian Fuentes in our youth group. His father, Tony Fuentes, has his own landscaping company, and he came uh, uh, for free, for free, pruned our trees, and we really appreciate that. I talked about him in the first service, and he walked in right when I talked about him. Uh, John Bush there carrying a bag of clippings, everyone pulling together. Uh, to beautify this campus, uh, to prepare for an event for our community, and we just appreciate it. Uh, Julie and Angie, you already saw them in the video. They're getting lots of FaceTime because they serve. They serve. They're always here doing something, uh, painting Kids Town, where our own Mr. Scott Horsley, who made our offering boxes, he added some accents uh, to Kids Town, and they painted yesterday, and I scared them yes it was awesome stan and joanne uh working together it's good to see stan improving as well uh without a cane there uh helping with the weeding and uh, some people find that relaxing uh, i just find it one of the worst things ever you know when we think about all the advancements we've made in our world we probably weed the exact same way they did the very first time a group of people decides, you know, we're kind of tired of hunting all the time. I think we're just going to stay in this one place and grow some crops. Ah, weeds! Okay, you send out the scrubs to go pull the weeds. It's probably the same thing. It, it's just work. It's just work. My wife says it's like zen. Anyone else feel that way when you pull weeds? Yeah, for some people it's quite relaxing, and you probably enjoy being on the landscaping team for that reason. But thank you to everyone. Uh, who, who helped over the weekend. Uh, we just want you to feel included. We want you to know that we're doing ministry in this place. And um, we just hung some new canvases on the wall in the hallways and in the cafe. You probably have noticed these canvases. They tell stories about the things we do around this place. Uh, some students like to compete on who ends up on the most canvases. And I tell them, uh, if you do stuff, and you'll probably see yourself on a canvas, you know. So we've got canvases now that are all since the virus started. We went to Bayou Bend State Park on the Friday of spring break, the Friday or Saturday of spring break, right when everything was going down, right, uh, to see all the alligators at the park. There's canvases up for that, but that's kind of weird to see because that was right when everything started, uh, but there's going to be canvases from car visits, from our senior recognition when we drove around to all the seniors. Uh, but look at those pictures. Look at the stories that they tell. And just know that you're at a church family. Uh, we're doing our best to love our neighbor. And you are needed. You are needed to make that happen. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, so you've now been thinking, do I need to be more bold? I think all of us do myself included i know some people look at me and they think oh wow you're so bold you're so outgoing for jesus but i'm not always that way i struggle i have moments of doubt sometimes i am thinking about my own stuff instead of sharing words of life with the person across from me you know the holy spirit brings sacred human beings together for a divine moment where you share the love of Christ, where you show his light. And sometimes we miss those moments because we're thinking about our own stuff. We're thinking about our own struggles, our own fears. 
and we miss that opportunity. Can we relate to that? We're not always bold like we should be. Uh, so this morning, I want to show you what it means to be bold for Jesus. And when you hear the word bold, we often think of like a soldier, a, a police officer, a fireman, maybe a, a football player. We think of someone that's doing something potentially dangerous or uh, you could get hurt or it scares you. Okay, how God defines being bold is actually intimately connected to his perfect love. So when I say bold this morning, I want you to also think of that phrase, perfect love. And I think we all agree Jesus showed this perfect love. So yes, it's going to come down to being more like Jesus. Okay, but think about being bold to being and showing, living, breathing the perfect love of Jesus. Um, and when it comes to being bold, well, let's let Scripture do the talking. This is 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is a story we all know well, but I bet we're going to share it in a way quickly that I bet you've never considered. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. This is David and Goliath here. Don't be ridiculous, King Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club. Yikes. <laughs> and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Like, this is violent, right? This is not like in Christian love here, right? He is saving these sheep clubbing bears and lions to death. So I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will now rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. <laughs> That's quite the speech, you know. All right, little boy, you know, go ahead, uh, and may the Lord be with you. Like, really? <laughs> okay, so we know this story. King Saul, this is the king of Israel, the one who should be the example, is not going to fight Goliath, the giant of the Philistine army. And David convinces him with this inspiring speech, and it doesn't inspire Saul to do it, does it? But Saul says, hey, you can wear my armor. You can wear my armor, which just looks silly on David. It's way too big for him. David is still a teenager. He hasn't grown into this armor. And it's also, listen carefully, it's not who he is. God has all wired us uniquely and differently, uh, gifting us with all kinds of spiritual gifts. And it is very key, very important to know those gifts so you can be true to who you are. If I go off and do some bizarre ministry position, you know, some churches are so large, they have all kinds of, of ministers on staff doing all kinds of things. If it doesn't involve students, how many of you are probably going to think he's not doing what he was meant to do? Right? David's being true to himself, and we often hear this story, and we think that a miracle happened because he killed Goliath. There's no miracle here. This is not a miracle. David has killed the bear and the lion, and when God calls you to make a bold decision in your life, you want to be living in a way where that decision was made before it had to be made. In other words, you were bold before the time came for you to be bold. 
David had already prepared for this moment by killing the bear and the lion. He already knew how to use a slingshot. He gathers five stones just in case. He only needs one. I don't care if you're nine foot tall or 20 foot tall. When you get a hundred mile per hour rock right between the eyes that's buried, you're going to drop. You're going to die. David is bold in this moment, and we're like amazed by his courage. Like, here both armies are just facing each other. No one in Israel has enough courage to fight this giant of a man, not even the king himself. And yet David says, you're defying the army of the living God. Of course, I'm going to take you down. That decision was already made before he had to make it. And when God calls us in a moment of truth to be bold for him, to be courageous, what we want is that life that precedes that moment where you have been living out the perfect love of Jesus. Because again, to be bold is to be living and breathing the perfect love of Jesus. Amen. So now go to my example from the New Testament. And maybe this will surprise you. This is Luke chapter 8, uh, verse 40. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. He's really popular right now, like, you know, One Direction back in the day. Crowds are following him around. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was 12 years old, was dying. And Jesus went with him. And he was surrounded by the crowds. You know, they wanted to see another miracle. He's really popular right now, and that was never a goal for Jesus. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Now, Luke is a physician, and in some versions, you'll see that she spent all of her money on doctors and could still not be healed. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. And immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. You know, you're like a celebrity. Everyone's touching you, right? But Jesus said, no, 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 no. Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble, and she fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him, and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This story might be one of the most unique in all the Bible. We have lots of stories of Jesus performing miracles. And this is a miracle, right? This is a miracle. But did Jesus give this miracle? Or did this woman take it? That's bold. This woman took her miracle from Jesus. She declared it. She decided he's going to heal me. Motivated by a perfect love in that moment and a faith that Jesus then rewards. Go in peace. Your faith has made you well. She steals the miracle. And that's not something we often see in Scripture that makes this story very unique, and it shows boldness. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. It's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, it seems simple, right? It seems simple. Obviously, if I'm going to pray to God, I have to believe in him, right? But I think if we're honest about some of our prayers... Are we always coming across when we pray like we believe in God? And without faith, it is impossible to please God. You must believe that he exists and 
that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He's not a God out to get you. He's not an I told you so God. He's not a what were you thinking God. He wants to listen and reward your faith. James chapter 1. Did anyone watch American Idol back in the day? I talked about this with students, that show. The very first season, Kelly Clarkson won, right? And probably still the best winner of American Idol. Some might say Carrie Underwood. Um, always a country singer that wins now. It's like, I'm sorry if you like country music. I'll pray for you. Um, but, um, you know, Kelly Clarkson won that first year, but... That first season, we, will, we were also introduced to a man, one of the judges. What was his name? Simon. Simon Cow. Oh, he's so mean. He's so brutally honest. You know, I mean, he would say the most horrible things that we would laugh at and then go, you know, ouch at the same time. But, you know, he saved some families. You know, every family has that one person that thinks they're good at something, you know, uh, I'm going to play professional baseball. And it's like, oh, sweetie. You know, we don't want to destroy their dreams. But at the same time, this is not how God gifted you. This is not you being true to how he's wired you. And how many times did Simon say, he actually said this in the first season. It may not be verbatim, but he basically looked, after an audition, he looked at that singer and he said, I want you to go home. I want you to hire a lawyer and I want you to sue anyone that ever told you you could sing. Like, ouch. <laughs> that one's going to leave a mark, right? But at the same time, some families, you know, the, the, the singer then comes out of the audition room. I didn't make it. I didn't make it. And mom, like, hugs him. Oh, sweetie, looks at the other relatives. Yes, yes, yes. We don't have to listen to her sing anymore. <laughs> you know, she'll now move on to something else. And, um. James, I tell you all of that to say that this is how James writes. This is how James talks. This short book of the New Testament, the half-brother of Jesus, James, who wasn't even a believer, is one of the most practical books of the New Testament. So full of advice, but sometimes it's ouch. Like, I can't believe James just said it that way. When he talks about the tongue, and how we get in trouble with the things we say, like, yikes, you know, tell me what you really feel, James. Like, wow, I feel terrible now, right? Um, but that's James. He speaks the truth. He's not concerned if you want to be his friend or not. And yet, here in chapter 1, he gives us the secret to being bold, to having this perfect love. And remember what I said, if you're going to be bold for Jesus... What's going to fuel that boldness is the perfect love of Jesus. It's love that is behind that courage to be bold. But it has to be refined. Another word for that is you have to be disciplined. Now, Jesus never sinned. So he probably never got a spanking. He never got grounded. You know, I once got swats at school. Because I communicated to my basketball coach in a nonverbal way. I didn't use words, but I, I let him know how I was feeling in a nonverbal way because he was always making fun of me and bullying me. You know how some coaches are? You know, they didn't get to play professional sports, and instead they have to wear those dorky bike shorts, and then they're like angry at everyone because here they are, a PE coach, and they take it out on you. Uh, that's kind of how I remember him, right? So he calls my dad and says, this is what your son did. He communicated to me clearly, non-verbally, and uh, I want to give him swats. Sure, and I'll give him swats when he gets home too. I got spanked twice, you know, and I deserved it, right? I deserved that discipline. I needed to be refined to show the perfect love of Jesus in your life, to be bold for Christ means you're going to need to be disciplined. And let's just be honest here. We all have flaws. We all have brokenness in us. We all have darkness. We all are selfish. We struggle with it. Even when we want to do something good for someone, we can make it selfish. 
It's not even on purpose. It's just like it comes out so naturally. We have to be refined. Look at James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So imagine Christmas morning. You get to open that present that you hope is the gift you have asked for, right? And you're so excited. And you're not going to be that person that opens the gift with a pocket knife because you're not a psycho, okay? You rip it open. You aren't that person, please tell me you're not. Well, you save everything and you make everyone wait 30 minutes before that present gets open. You just tear it open. You open it, you look inside. You got it for me. Cancer! Oh, I've always wanted cancer! Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is the greatest gift ever. It's also version four. How did you, you, how long did you wait in line to get four? I hear it's four times worse than the first version of cancer I had years ago. Now I'm cool again, I have cancer, this is awesome. Wow, we have been around people that have been through some horrific things and there is something bizarre about how they stay faithful to God and how they are still a light for Jesus. And no, they're not jumping up and down for joy that's not what James means here. This is about being refined. It's a joy that comes through discipline. Through those hard moments where you receive that discipline from the Lord to grow into his man, into his son, into his daughter, that make you stronger, that make you more bold. It's something that has to be earned. But yes, we can be around people like this, and it, it almost sounds silly, like it's awkward. Like, how can you be full of joy when you're going through this? You sound weird, and you are going to sound different. That's what we're called to be as believers, to look different, which means sometimes it's going to stand out from the world around you. But James says here, I'm going to break it into three parts for you, for you to find that boldness through the perfect love of Jesus, the first one is being disciplined. Don't resist the Lord's discipline. We all need it. We will always need it. Don't think, oh, that guy's like 80 years old. He doesn't need to be disciplined. We all need it. You never stop growing. You never stop learning. And Jesus, he was never spanked or grounded but he was still disciplined. He still had to learn obedience. Luke chapter 2 says he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He had to grow. He had to learn. He had to be obedient. There was still discipline. So remember that refining love, that perfect love that you seek. Don't resist the Lord's discipline. The second D, James 1.5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Who in here needs wisdom? This is one of the most underused verses in all the Bible here. Okay? This is about discernment is the D word here. You have discipline. You have discernment. Discernment is making a smart decision. Sometimes to be bold for Jesus when we're making big decisions in life. We often look at decisions as being either right or wrong. And I get this a lot from high school seniors when it comes time to pick a college. And I just want to smack them in Christian love because they'll be like, Pastor Rich, I've been accepted by two colleges. Which one do I pick? And I'm like, Pick both. Pick either one. But you don't understand. What if I get it wrong? 
Jesus won't love me anymore. I'll burn in hell. You know, that's how they act about it, right? And I'm like, sweetie, oh, you're so cute. You think you're an adult. Um, you still have so much growing up. No offense. Um, it's not always right or wrong when we're making decisions to be bold for Jesus. So many decisions we make in life are kind of in between right and wrong. They're in this gray area where it's really more about making a decision that is wise versus unwise. Does that make sense to everyone? It's about making a decision that's wise versus unwise, not necessarily right or wrong. And this is where we need to be bold for Christ. We look to him for that wisdom, that discernment. Because we, it's not obvious. You know, it's not always obvious right or wrong. Sometimes it's wise versus unwise. Maybe one college is a wiser choice than another college for one senior in particular. Okay? Think about this. We're, we're in that time of year. We all know what this week is going to be, right? And we tend to even look at voting as being you're either right or you're wrong. And that's how we treat each other. Th these extremes, they produce fear. And fear is not perfect love. We don't want to make decisions based on fear. Okay, can, can I just give some breaking news? I will never vote for someone, you will never vote for someone who is perfect. Bless you if that's what you're thinking, if that's what I'm thinking. Only Jesus is perfect, right? You're not voting for someone that you think is perfect. They're flawed like you are. You have to pick and choose. That's in this gray area of wise versus unwise, and hopefully through the perfect love of Jesus, you make a decision that is wise wiser than the other decision but that decision better be made through the perfect love of christ through the weapon of love love covers a multitude of sins all the prophets all the law hangs on loving your neighbor loving your god loving yourself it better be motivated by love because when it is Look at this next part of James. This is so cool. I love this. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So this first part of James, you want to be bold. So you have to find his perfect love to fuel that boldness. So here in James, he tells us about this refining love. You receive the discipline of the Lord. Then you go to him for wisdom, for discernment. And now the final D, you declare it. You declare it. Sometimes you can actually declare something in the name of Jesus and God is catching up with you. You've already declared it because it's flowed through his discipline, through his discernment. And now you are prepared to act, to make a decision in this gray area of wise versus unwise. You're ready to make a decision that is motivated, rooted in his perfect love. And we'll still make mistakes. But you don't look back. Because it's motivated by his love, you declare it. I want to give you an example of this. Uh, so I went to see some ninth grade football, Sy Lakes High School. Mr. Omar plays on one of the teams. His best friend not here today, uh, Mr. Malik Hall, uh, plays on one of the ninth grade teams. Uh, they're both not the biggest guys, and they play football. So they have courage. They've got like a, a David Hart inside of them, right? And a Malik of, oh, bless his team. It was a, it was a slaughter. I won't, we won't get hung up on numbers 50 to nothing. But um, the running back, 
Malik is like a Chipotle burrito compared to the size of this running back. This guy was a beast. And he was going for like another 80-yard touchdown, and all of a sudden you see this lightning bolt, perfect angle, speeding across the field. Malik is fast. That was my first time to see Malik sprint. I knew he ran the 100 meter in eighth grade, and he's going to be running at Cy Lakes High School. And he wasn't going to tackle this guy, but he pushed him out of bounds. The decision in that moment to be bold, to be courageous, to show heart and hustle, that decision was made before the moment. You know, I saw the end of this uh, race, a triathlon. It was just a quick video. Oh my goodness, it captured my heart. Maybe you saw it too. Where the first and second, every uh, tri uh, triathlon ends with the run, right? So they're running. First and second place. Uh, first place has been in first place the whole time. Second place about the entire race. And the final turn, first place runner just keeps going straight right into a bunch of uh, race officials. It was almost like a little pit stop area. He went the wrong direction. The other runner is now first place, makes the turn, looks behind him, sees what happened, and he stops. Let's the runner take his rightful place at first place and cross the finish line. That runner then gives him a hug and you see this look on his face that's almost like, I don't know if it's like, you know, there's a virus, right? I don't, I don't even know how old this footage is, uh, probably before the virus. But he has this look on his face like, why are you hugging me? And if you think about it, it makes sense if that is in fact what he's thinking. Because the decision to be bold in that moment, through the perfect love of Christ, that decision was made before the moment came in how he was raised, and how he's been living his life, the character that he shows, the integrity. So for him, it was like breathing. It was a natural response. Someone's and I don't know if he's a believer. I'm just using this as an analogy. You receive the discipline. You look to God for wisdom, and you declare it. I declare that I'm going to be honest in a moment of truth, and I've already decided it before that moment comes. So when it comes, like breathing, I make a decision that shows the perfect love of Christ. And it's going to surprise the world. They may give me a hug. <laughs> they may look at you, <laughs> you need medication. You are really weird <laughs> in how you love others, you know. Uh, so that decision to show courage, to show heart, to be bold is made before the moment. David killed the lion and the bear before taking down Goliath. You know, and, and sometimes, yes, you're going to make that bold decision, and God's going to catch up with you. He's going to be proud of you. Okay, that's what you've declared. It's motivated through my love. Let's do this. Let's do this. No matter which college you picked, I'm going to be there. God's going to be there. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit waiting for you to keep being a light for Him wherever you pick. You know, it's not a right or wrong. It might just be a wise versus unwise. And, um, so we want to recognize that, di that uh, difference. So we want that boldness that comes through the perfect love. And James tells us to receive the discipline, to look to God for discernment, and then to declare it. And you know, there's probably been no time in our history where we don't need wimpy prayers right now. When you pray it, you need to believe it. You need to be all in Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith, uh, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do. That's the discipline. Yet, he did not sin. So, because of that, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And there we will receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So right there, Jesus made this boldness possible. Because he 
would allowed himself to be disciplined. Making, uh, he would go out and pray by himself to his father to get that discernment, that wisdom, and then by his actions, he declared it. He declared that perfect love. He defeated fear with love. He defeated hate with love. It's the greatest weapon the world has ever witnessed. We've all heard the phrase, uh, toxic masculinity, right? Um, first, I will say, yeah, although men and women are very different, there's probably some women that behave in this way, too, when we hear this phrase. It's not exclusive to men, uh, but yes, it gets attached to men most often. We are raised in a way to not be wimpy. We have to be tough. We have to defend ourselves. You know, we have to get that respect. We have to be independent. And sometimes because of that, you struggle to connect with Jesus. You think about Jesus as a painting in Europe where he's wearing the long, white, flowing robe. And he looks almost delicate, like a flower you just want to sniff. And I wish I had hair that beautiful, right? Man, God, we, we forget that Jesus, yes, he's tender. But he is tough. And so we'll get men to pay attention when they hear that tough part, right? Because we don't want to be wimpy, you know? But yet when you're toxic with your masculinity, does it make you look emotionally secure or emotionally insecure? It makes you look insecure. It makes you look defensive. It makes you look like you're uncertain. It makes you look like you're making a decision based on fear, using tactics of bullying and threats and violence. The good decisions are not made based on fear. Think about that for a second. Good decisions are not made based on fear. To be bold for Je Jesus means you make decisions based on his perfect love. You make the decision motivated by the love of someone else, for someone else. Does that make sense? We're not going to be perfect at this. But we better, as believers in the kingdom of God, be motivated and fueled and rooted and directed by his love by the perfect love that he earned. No war ever started because of love. It started because of fear. It started because you feel threatened. But when I think of love as an example above and beyond Jesus, I think about Mr. Rogers. How many men might look at Mr. Rogers, or even women, if, if you don't have the right definition of being bold, look at Mr. Rogers and think, he's a wimp. What does he have to offer? And I think about this scene, you know, every, we all have flaws. You know, if someone's around long enough, you're going to find something to write about that person that's not positive. That's true of all of us. I've never read anything negative about Mr. Rogers. There's probably some negative stuff out there. I don't know. But I do have this one scene that I remember watching. When Mr. Rogers takes off his shoes and socks and he shares this kiddie pool with a black officer who also takes off his shoes and socks. Anyone remember seeing that? Anyone see that? And he makes this incredible statement about the dangers of racism by teaching these children and all watching, this is my friend, I honor him for what he does for a living, I share this kiddie pool, it's a hot day, I'm cooling my feet off in this water with my friend here. That's courage. No weapon was needed. That's boldness. That's the kind of love that changes things. And that's what our world, what we as followers, we're carrying this banner. We should be carrying it. 
I hope we're carrying it. This banner of love, of his perfect love, and our decisions are being motivated by that love. So I love that example. I would love for someone to compare me to Mr. Rogers. So if you're not feeling bold this morning, and I don't always feel bold, then maybe we need to love others more deeply. Maybe we need to love those people we're angry at, that we're judging. Maybe we need to love those people more deeply. Because that's how we're going to be bold for Christ in a way that honors Christ. Let's close with 1 John chapter 4. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence. You see the connection of some of these verses here? Because we live like Jesus here in this world. And as we, uh, so such love has no fear. Such love has no fear. Because perfect love expels all fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced this perfect love if we're driven by fear, we're afraid of being punished. We're afraid of someone hurting us, of taking what belongs to us, of harming us, of threatening us. That does not show the perfect love of Christ. Your decisions, more than ever, for all of us, myself included, need to be rooted in the perfect love of Christ, need to be modified, uh, to need to be defined in that gray area by his perfect love because there's not always a right or wrong there's a wise and an unwise a wiser than the other option and when we get to that moment if we have been disciplined if we have gone to Jesus for his discernment for wisdom then we can declare it in the name of Jesus and his perfect love. Look at verse 18. Did we already do verse 18? Okay, 19. So we love each other because he loved us first. But if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, those who love God, must also love their fellow believers. So be bold. Be bold. And understand that's not a way of looking tough. At least in the eyes of the world. In the eyes of God, it's showing the perfect love of Jesus. And yet, it's stronger and more powerful than any weapon the world has ever known. And it's really the only thing that changes hearts. Amen. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your perfect love, Jesus, who you are and what you've done. You learned obedience. You grew in every way. And you backed it up on the cross. And Lord, we want to be bold for you. But that means being emotionally secure, not defensive. It means listening. It means being disciplined. It means being refined. And then it means in those tough gray areas where it's not obviously a right or wrong, we just want to honor you. We look to you for that wisdom. And then we declare it. We declare it in your name boldly. And we're confident. We're confident in that moment because we've done so through your perfect love. So we approach that throne of grace with confidence. And we are known as a people that loves all people. So we close this prayer praying as Jesus taught us to pray. This is the warring family who will lead us now. Howdy from the warring family. Please join us in the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That's awesome. Good morning, Life Path Church. My name is Lee. I'm Pastor Rich's wife, and I'm glad to see you all here in person and on live stream and watching us later. Um, you are all very, very welcome. Um, every week we talk about connection cards and how we would love for you to fill out a connection card and let us know that you are here. Um, we have it on the website and on the app. But today I want to make a special challenge, and that is to put in a prayer request on your connection card. I would love for everyone to put in a prayer request, and I already gave Nora a heads up that she's going to be getting a flood of them this week, so she's looking for them. Um, we all have prayer requests. This has been a hard year for pretty much everyone in some way or another, and I know that you have something you need prayed over. I have things I need prayed over, and we are a body, and if we can all pray over each other, we will be that much stronger. So be bold this week. Put in a prayer request or a praise if you've got something you want to give thanks for. But that's my challenge this week with the, with the connection cards. Make use of them, please. Um, mark on your calendars. Next month, we have a blood drive. No, not next month, December. December 20th is a blood drive. I'm getting ahead of myself. I forget. It's like 2nd July or something. I forget what today is. But... Uh, December 20th, we are having a blood drive, so put that on your calendar and be ready for it. You can count it as three Christmas gifts, because when you give blood, you're saving three lives. So that's three Christmas gifts, plus they give you a freebie, like socks or a t-shirt when you give blood, so you can re-gift that, mark somebody else off your Christmas list. So it's really just a winning situation for everybody, so put that on your calendars. Next Sunday, I am so excited, we're doing outdoor worship again in between the services starts at 10 30 if you weren't here last week it was awesome i discovered that my mask can double as a receptacle for my tears when i'm crying happy tears of worship it was so great we set up chairs out there so if you don't feel comfortable sitting the whole time you can sit in a chair or standing the whole time you can sit in a chair um and everyone's spaced out we all wear our masks but it is just fantastic and so i really encourage you to be here if you can 10.30 next Sunday for our outdoor worship singing. It's, it's awesome. Um, and then Saturday night is our trunk or treat. We're very excited about this. It's our first one ever. If you are decorating your trunk, you've already signed up for that, please be here between 4 and 4.30, already decorated. We need one more person to decorate their trunk, one more family to bring a, a decorated trunk. So see Mr. Joe for that or email him. His email address is on the website. Um, we also need volunteers to help during the event, setting up during it and cleaning up afterwards. So again, see Mr. Joe um, if you can help with that. Um, thank you very much for all the candy. As you saw earlier, you were very bold with bringing the candy. So thank you so much for all of that. But we do need volunteers to help out. And um, also invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite any little kids you know to come and get candy because clearly we have plenty of it and we're excited about that. So now is the time when we take up our offering. Um, we, you can do it online, you can do it by mail, or you could do it here. But thank you so much for, for being here this morning. Thank you, sweetie. That was awesome. Thank you my little miniature Rubik's Cube in my hand here to begin the fidgeting again. Um, thank you for being here. Let's stand for a blessing. Yeah, I keep praying for Pastor Ellie and his family to get home safely. And um, Father God, we go out as your church this week to be bold with your perfect love, shining it all around us, believing in the best of one another, and Lord, we do so through your discipline, through discernment, and then reach that moment where we declare it to the world in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>